is about Greenkeeper and managing dependencies. And what is Greenkeeper and what does managing dependencies even mean? So Greenkeeper aims to be a nice bot to serve as humans. And Laurie put it um, in, in one of his recent talks, put it like this, Greenkeeper is NPM outdated as a service. Or as we put it on our website, it's always up to date, depend, uh, always up-to-date NPM dependencies, sorry, <coughs> and zero hassle. And this sounds all nice and fancy, but I figured this isn't a sales show, this is a community conference. And in this room there are 150 people who deeply care about NPM, and so I want to put the situation to really good use. So instead of trying to get you to buy Greenkeeper, I'm trying to make you to deeply understand Greenkeeper and the role it wants to play in this ecosystem we are all contributing to. So hi, my name is Stefan, um, as Raquel already told you, and I had the idea um, to build Greenkeeper, and I did that with a few friends. And usually when we like introduce ourselves, we just list a few projects we've worked on here and there. But I figured that the things I've been working on logically lead to Greenkeeper. So instead, I'll just tell you a little about them. So you probably know this feeling when you really have to do something, and so instead you just start cleaning your room or your desk, um, because we are all very good at procrastination. So back when I started programming, all I really wanted to do is build apps. And I soon figured out that it's really complicated and way too annoying. I just want to build apps. So found a little something that's called Hoodie. And it's an open source project that gives you generic backend for your apps, and it allows you to build apps really, really fast because you have sign up, data storage, sync, all that already there. And you don't have to build it over and over and over again. And like most open source projects, it's not 100% done yet. So instead of building my own apps, I got involved with Hoodie and helped building Hoodie and modularizing it and maintaining the packages that it consists of. So you should check out Hoodie. It's hood.ie. But as soon as I said, as soon as I was working on Hoodie, I got really, really annoyed by publishing all these packages because there are a lot of steps that I had to do over and over and over and over again. And they're really complicated. They're error prone. There's a lot of stuff to remember and to manage, especially if you have a lot of people on the team. And so again, instead of building Hoodie, I built this tool to fix publishing, and it's called Semantic Release. We heard a few um, references to it already, which is fine, because people seem to like it. And as you already um, heard from Andrew, it's built on top of conventions, on top of commit message conventions, and it figures out Samber for you and change logs. And my number one learning from this writing this tool is that enforcing and building on top of best practices is a really good idea if you want to build tooling. So now the publishing was fixed, I could go back to Hoodie. Well, until I got annoyed again. Like, we had to keep all these dependencies and all these packages up to date. And at Hoodie, we use the same, um, like we have a set of dependencies that we use over and over again, especially for dev dependencies, so testing tools, um, tool set and our linting and all that stuff, it's, it's all the same everywhere. So this situation here, it probably happened a few too many times, like, oh cool, there's this new version of this cool package and there are so many cool things in there, but shit. Now I have to go into 20 projects, check it out, pull it, um, change the package JSON with the new version, run the tests, push it up, open a pull request, wait for the CI result, merge it back in, and then maybe also get a new version out. So this was really, really annoying because it's like kept happening over and over and over again and was keeping us from, from doing our work. So again, I had to build something first. And so I walked up to my friend, Christoph, who was working on Hoodie as well, and I said, let's automate this. Automation is nice. 
So we just needed two things. That's what I figured. We need updates from NPM, so we know whenever a package updates or publishes a new version. And the second thing is we need to have a way to easily create pull requests because we knew that we have to um, create like commits and branches and pull requests for a lot of repositories and it's like going to waste a lot of resources if we just clone every um, um, repo. So luckily, um, one of the original founders of Hoodie, Jan Lennart, um, is also the vice president of Apache CouchDB, which the original NPM registry was also built on. And so I knew there's a changes feed in every CouchDB, which gives you real-time updates of what's happening inside the database. And luckily, NPM also exposes this feed for us. It's available under skimdb.npmjs.com, and we heard that in the Tonic talk already. Um, you can use this to build really cool stuff. So the first part was done. We have NPM updates. And then we need the second part, which is easily create commits, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if you can read it. It's almost exactly one year ago that I wrote this tweet where I said, I want to create commits we had a GitHub API with minimal overhead, ideally only sending a patch. Is there anything ready-made? Hashtag lazy Twitter. And really, this was one of the very, very few times where I um, did NPM search and I didn't find what I wanted. So four days later, the search is over. I wrote it myself. So luckily, GitHub exposes a full Git data API, so you can handle um, trees and blobs and all that um, stuff via the API and you don't have to actually clone the repositories. And so I wrote this little module, as you do, um, that allows you to just um, create new commits and branches without having the stuff locally. So yay, the second part was done. We just needed a little bit of glue code in between a web service, but that was stuff we, we, we knew how to do, especially after building Hoodie. And so ready was our bot. And here's how it originally worked. So we have our three players, which is NPM, Greenkeeper, and GitHub. So NPM tells us a module changed. So then we figure out, like, is this a new version? Is this relevant to us? And who's depending on that module? And as soon as we figured that out, we just send pull requests to the repositories. And this is how it looked like. So you get a pull request. It tells you which version is affected, uh, which mod dependency is affected, which version, a bit of metadata, and some advice what you should do about, um, with this. But it turned out this is only really useful for so-called out-of-range updates, or what we call them. And what does this mean? So you know, you heard about this earlier as well. In NPM, we have version ranges that help you um, embrace Sember and its semantic meaning. So in this case, we have um, a dependency that has a defined version number with the caret character 4.0.0, which means if version 5.0.0 comes out, it's not part of this version range. It's out of the range. And the same is true if you have a tilde character, then minor versions are outside of the range. Or if you have no range at all, then a patch version is outside of that range and it works really, really well for that. But soon this guy came around, I'm sorry, these folks came around, and we noticed pretty quickly that our PRs are triggering CI builds. And this is actually really, really useful and valuable data, because if the project has um, a decent test coverage, it can tell you if the project still works with the new, um, with the new version applied. So it does not only take the work away from you, the automatic um, CI builds that are triggered, they also tell you if your project is still working, so it gives you even more insight. And again, best practices, the better the tests, the better the results are with this. And so, knowing that we have this insight, we could then also tackle in-range updates without being annoying. So, again, we have this caret character, 4.0.0, and now if a version 4.0.1 comes out, we can actually do something useful here. And these versions are the ones that are actually really, really dangerous because they just get installed and you don't notice or you don't actively upgrade to this version. It just happens. So these are dangerous because if someone doesn't 
play according to the rules of Semver or mistakes happen, stuff can break here. So now we were using the data that we got back from the, from the CI. So in this case, the same procedure as before. NPM told us the module change. We figured out who's depending on it. But now we check, is this inside of the existing version range? And rather than creating a pull request directly, we just created a new branch with this version update applied. And then GitHub comes back to us and tells us with the status API, did it fail or did it pass? And if it passed, we can just delete the branch. Everything is fine. Your version range is still valid. But if it fails, something is broken. And so now we create a new pull request for in-range updates. And it looks something like this. So in this case, ESLint um, broke a build process, which means the project really is broken. Because if you now go in and do npm install, you will get a version that breaks your build. So this is, this is really cool. And I'm pretty sure you totally want this by now. Um, do you? Yeah? OK, how do you get it? Of course, Greenkeeper is an NPM module. So you install it globally with NPM I-G Greenkeeper. I is short for install and dash G for dash dash global. Once you have that CLI tool installed globally, you can do Greenkeeper login, which will do the GitHub OAuth dance for you. And then you can change directory into your project and then run Greenkeeper enable or GK enable, which is a shortcut which saves you characters. And in the beginning, we really wanted to focus our development efforts on, on this core service. And so we didn't want to spend that much time on building a website because, you know, building web apps and sites is hard. Um, but we figured out that it's time to make Greenkeeper more accessible for more people, not only for node developers or people who are um, familiar and comfortable using CLI tools. And also because we are pretty fed up with like needing four slides to explain how to use this. So I'm happy to show you something new today, which is our new web application, where everything happens in the browser. You can just hit the sign in button, go to GitHub, come back, and you can just enable repositories with one click. And you can find this under app.greenkeeper.io. And this is a beta, so to speak. Like, it, it's, it's live, it works. And we are really happy if you can like, try it out, go there, give us feedback if you think where, where we could go with this. And eventually, we will make it the default way to use Greenkeeper. So if you go to the Greenkeeper website, you just hit the sign up button, and you can get to this app and no longer have the CLI tool, which will then be a pro thing. So with this web application, for the first time, we can also offer some more insight into what Greenkeeper is doing. And so here you can see that if you go to a specific project, you see the open pull requests that are there and what the statuses are and what's happening here. And I wish I could um, have announced even more at this moment, but we wanted to get it right first, so you have to wait a little more. But what I can say is that we want to make this data also available for package authors, not only for consumers. So that package authors can have a look into the builds that we are triggering. So if you publish a new version, you get insight into how many builds failed due to this update or what are the reigns you can know how, how good you're doing in terms of Semver and um, yeah, being staying compatible for your users. But there's a problem. As you know, there are a lot of modules out there. And as you also know, people depend on a lot of modules in their projects. And so all of a sudden, if you happen to enable Greenkeeper on your project, it's too much noise. And this is like the number one complaint with the service. And it's frustrating because it's, it keeps popping up over and over again. And we're trying to make this better. But there are some concepts that I want to explain to put this into context, what noise means. So for example, a lot of people are asking us, rather than sending pull requests in real time to make a weekly digest, or to merge pull requests automatically as soon as they pass. But that's not really the philosophy of Greenkeeper. 
we think that running these updates in isolation is exactly what makes Greenkeeper valuable because you know exactly which dependency you broke and what time and you have this information available immediately without having to figure it out when you see this digest. And like, like it will probably end up being you get this digest and every week you know it's broken now, but where's the insight then? So we think having this focused and isolated is really important. And we think that Greenkeeper is a bot that should take chores away from you, but it shouldn't make decisions for you. So it shouldn't merge stuff for you. And here, in, in not only in that regard, but especially in that regard, we are in line with NPM, where they say re, we want to reduce friction and don't add force. So we want to report the rising problems early, and we don't want to use, cause new problems by merging stuff automatically, which just, if you speak it out loud, sounds really dangerous. So here are some tips. And Remember when I said that like building on top of best practices is a good thing. Here are some of them. Good tests. So for, for example, we have people complaining that like Greenkeeper sending them false pull requests because like a new version came out, we created a branch and then the um, CI reported a fail and then we opened a pull request and it turns out like it was just like a test um, service like code coverage or um, browser testing was down. So the thing here is we work with the information that you provide us, and so if you have a test suite that's flaky, maybe you should invest more in your tests so that they have reproducible results and that they're reliable. The second thing is use version ranges, because if you use version ranges, you will get a lot less pull requests. As I said, we can, if, if um, stuff keeps passing, we don't have to bother you. We can just delete stuff. So, Version ranges are really, really great, and they're really, really powerful because they embrace the, the, the insight that Semver, like the, the metadata that Semver version numbers give us. And together with your tests, Greenkeeper can have your back on fails there. So if someone messes it up and like there's, there's a mistake, you'll know. So you can just use version ranges. You then don't have to pin versions anymore and just use them. It reduces noise. And Another thing is like, we had um, modules and they publish big new version with all these new features and this huge rewrite and then they publish this version and everyone is excited to try it out and like an issue comes in, oh well, obviously it's a big rewrite, you messed something up, version whatever, like a new patch version comes out. Then the next issue comes out and we have like, 10 versions within five hours, because when you change a lot, a lot of stuff is broken. You have these, these many versions. And so because we want to do stuff in real time, Greenkeeper sends out 10 or 20 pull requests if you, if you do 10 or 20 versions in five hours. But NPM already offers a way around this, and that's called this tags. So if you install a package, it automatically installs um, the version that has the latest this tag attached to it. And this is, this is happening automatically. If you publish a version, by default it gets the latest this tag. And what you can do is you can introduce beta channels for your packages. So you can actually publish new versions to the registry, but it's not the default install target. And you can tell your um, early adopters or like the community, hey, try this new version out, report um, issues to us, or if you find, um, find them, and if there are any, you can publish one new version with the, with the fixes, and then you can make that the default install target, and only that will be sent out via Greenkeeper. So it's, um, it's a great way to, um, to have multiple release channels. And I actually wrote a blog post on how to do this. It's under bit.ly slash this tags. And another thing is you can let Greenkeeper do the cleanup. So if you have um, a lot of pull requests for the same dependency and for the same version, as soon as you merge one of these pull requests, as soon as you have made your decision, Greenkeeper will do the, uh, to do the cleanup. So if you have pull requests that include the same version, so let's say you have a pull request for version 4.0.0, and there's also one open for 4.0.1 and you're using a version range. When you merge 4.0.0, it will close and delete like the 4.0.1 um, 
pull request because it's already included. And equally, if you merge the 4.0.1, it closes the 4.0.0 because it's lower as the version you merged. So Greenkeeper can do the, green, um, the, the cleanup for you. You just have to make the decision. And equally, if you merge a Greenkeeper pull request and now all the other Greenkeeper pull requests are no longer mergeable because there's a merge conflict in the package JSON, we will automatically rebase that against master so that won't happen as well. So you can just make your decision and then let Greenkeeper take over again with the, with the dull chores. So I really don't want to be the person that says, like, you're holding it wrong. But the thing is that the Greenkeeper experience is suffering a lot from underlying problems. And we would much rather want to fix the underlying problems rather than work around them with Greenkeeper. So we want to build on best practices and we want to um, help spread them. So help appreciate it here. Um, if you have ideas that are in line with the philosophy that I just described with like isolated updates and taking away chores but don't making decisions, that's great. If you convince us that this philosophy is wrong, that's also great. Or if you want to help educate people about this best practices that are laid out. If you want to send pull requests with better tests that remove dependency, uh, the dependency on a third party service or stuff like that, that's all really great and we really appreciate it. So you can talk to us or help other people to, to um, build on these best practices. So to sum this up, writing software is embracing change and Greenkeeper makes that change visible. So that is a key part because, because Greenkeeper sending you pull requests, you suddenly feel like there's noise, when in reality, all these changes of, your of these modules you're depending on, it's already there, you just don't notice. So it's making it visible, it's not creating that noise. So I hope with this talk, you now understand how Greenkeeper works, why it works the way it works, and that you got the philosophy we're trying to um, apply here. So Greenkeeper is a service that we really just wanted to have for, for ourselves, but we also made it available for everyone. And you can use it for free on your open source projects. Um, but there are also support private and even enterprise plans available. Um, we support private scope packages as well as scope packages. And we're also working on shrink wrap support to fulfill your enterprise needs. And if you want to support us, that's really great. If you don't want to or if you cannot support us, that's cool. But we, we, we think it's, it's um, like cool if you use Greenkeeper on your open source modules and help us like, have the NPM ecosystem be up to date and like, have managed dependencies. And I'm around here to talk about these ideas that I um, hope some of you have. I have stickers, and that's it. Thank you.